Welcome back everybody. I'm gonna do some valve train work on 1113 today. So I have its original pieces on the bench here. The rockers, the stands, the oil tube, and the push rods. We'll just start with the push rods for now. They're gonna be probably the simplest part of today's video. I've already cleaned these and I've inspected the wear surfaces. They all look good. I've given the spin test too to see if they're bent. Now, what you need is a flat machined surface. We'll just pretend that this cardboard is just for demonstration purposes. I usually use the table saw top out in the other area over there. It's the nicest, flattest thing I have. Basically, find a flat machined surface and just roll them. And if they roll nice and smooth, they're not bent. But if they'd go like thump, 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 or you'd see one end or the other wobble as it rolls, that means that they're bent. All eight of these checked out. So we'll just get those in the engine real quick and get them off the bench here. Okay, redneck wind chime here. Quiet these things down. You can see I've got the push rods in this piece of cardboard numbered uh, one through eight with front noted on here. I've just always been taught to keep them in order and that's what I do. Um, I've heard arguments both ways. Some say it doesn't matter, some say it does. I guess my official stance on it is, are you out in the shop doing something? If the answer is yes, well, I'm pretty sure we'll get along. That's about as far as I need to take it. So, got a little can of oil down here. I'll get the end that goes down in the lifter coated. And the lifters have somewhat of an open uh, or a recessed cup on the end that the push rod actually uh, sets down into. And you can feel if you're guided into the lifter or not. So we just repeat the process, oil on the end, guide it down into the lifter and go until we're out of push rods. Now, to talk about the rockers. Um, you guys didn't see me take these pieces apart when I was disassembling 1113. Um, I'll put a link up here to basically the first video that I posted of 1113 after we brought it home. And I had already had the cylinder head off of it at that time, was assessing condition, I wanted to get a look at the bores. But I noticed when I took these rockers off, we have this oil tube here that feeds oil to them. This tube had been broken. You can see right here where those two pieces fit together. That uh, piece of copper tube had cracked and I don't know how long it had been cracked, but I'm guessing a significant portion, if not all of the lubrication oil that was meant to get out to those uh, rockers had been leaking. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna find here. I've just kind of been inspecting these a little bit and I think I can feel like there's some catches in there. Stiff spot, I think it's free. Stiff spot, free. It might just be dry. It might just be dirty, maybe a little corroded. Or that might be wear that I'm feeling in there on that shaft. It should be a smooth pivot, and it's like catch, catch, catch. So I don't know. We'll just take these things apart and see what we're dealing with. We'll just concentrate on this uh, first set for now. These are more pieces that I also keep in order so that they go back in their original positions. And pretty simple assembly here. It's just cotter pins, springs, and washers for the most part. So we'll just start by pulling this pin off the end. Washer, spring, washer. Just having a quick look inside that. Guess it doesn't look horrible. There is at least uh, oil inside there. Stand comes off. Want to check these, make sure they're not cracked because they are they are like a cinch style uh, retainer where this uh, large cutout is and the nut just bears down on it and it cinches down on the shaft. I've taken these things out in two pieces before. 
Next rocker comes off. And we have washer. And this spring is captured by this L fitting here that uh, routes the oil into the rocker tube. So we'll loosen this fitting, twist it out. So as I'm twisting this out, I notice uh, another thing to look for when you're taking these apart. I've seen this more than once. You can see just off the end of my thumb that groove that's been worn in the side of that, uh, that brass fitting. That's from these spring coils bearing up against it. And I've taken some of these apart where that is just about worn into the passage that goes through the fitting. This one's not horrible, but I'll probably uh, go through my stockpile and see if I have anything better to replace it with. So finally that spring can come off. We also look at those spring coils in the area of that fitting, make sure the spring has not been wearing. Spring is usually harder than the fitting, so usually the wear happens to the fitting. Washer. Okay, we have some barbs or some burrs around where that fitting went in, and I don't want to uh, scar the internal portion of this rocker. So I'll take care of those burrs real quick. Pretty sure I found it. I think it's right down here. That's the only spot where I felt the file drag. Now we'll see how that comes off. Perfect. And we have the other stand. Again, it looks good. Final rocker. Washer, spring washer, and all we have left is the other cotter pin in the end of the shaft. So that's really all it takes to disassemble one of these. Like I say, just kind of keep all these components in order, put them back in the same place that they came from, and all should be well, assuming condition is good. You can see they're plenty dirty. So I'm going to clean all this stuff, give it a real good inspection, and report back. All right, I've got everything cleaned up. It was dirty, but I'm pretty happy with how everything looks. Not seeing anything for wear on the shaft, so I was worried these things had been starving for oil. I think they'd been running a little bit dry, but everything looks really good. I can't pick up any noticeable wear on the shaft at all when I measure it. No galling, no scoring. There are a couple of uh, old witness marks. It looks like maybe some corrosion had formed in there at one time from the years that this thing had spent sitting. And I'm thinking that's where that catch was that I was feeling when I was pivoting that rocker on the shaft. But everything, for the most part, you can see a little bit of staining left inside that bore. That was some of that uh, old corrosion I was talking about. Pretty well cleaned up and everything's looking pretty good. So clearance of my rockers on the shaft. It has rocker arm bushings. We might as well cover this real quick. The earlier tractors like 1113 did not have bushings in these rockers. The later ones did. So you could replace the bushing on a later one. Renew that clearance if you had to. These are just the solid forged rockers. But... Clearance remains the same. Clearance between shaft and bushing, one to two and a half when it was new. Maximum permissible, six. When I did the measurements on all these pieces, three of those were running three thousandths of an inch. One of them was at four. And I think the only reason they're that wide is because perhaps with the broken oil line that fed this fitting, they were running a little bit dry for a little while. But I'm not going to worry about it. I'm technically only halfway through to maximum permissible clearance and everything's within spec with the modern oils and a limited amount of hours 1113 is going to see i'm never going to wear those things the rest of the way out so they're staying just the way they are so shaft has been thoroughly flushed out lots of black stuff usually comes out of these a lot of settle out this is a hollow shaft with a plug on each end and the oil comes in from that line into this fitting the fitting feeds the shaft and each rocker is positioned right above a feed hole and that's how the rockers all get their uh, lubrication supply. I leave this old cotter pin in this end as an indicator so I can remember which end I started from. That's regarding putting everything back right where it used to be. And where the oil feeds into the pivots on the rockers, there's a hole that's drilled in here. You can see off my finger that hole uh, feeds a passage that comes up here where the ball stud goes through. 
and basically there's a drilling that feeds into that hole so the oil comes through hits the ball stud has to come out that drilling and that's what lubricates the cup that's on the bottom of the push rod that cradles the end of that uh, that ball stud so that's how all of that gets lubricated last thing we need to look at is the wear that's on the pivot pad on the end of the arm. These always get worn from contacting the old valves and we will need to renew that surface, but these look pretty good. A lot of meat left there, they're just fat. I'll give you a, a comparison here real quick. I hate to bust on poor old 2115. We'll do a quick side by side. Look at the, <laughs> the material difference there that's left on 1113s versus 2115s. These are the same rocker, same part number. Between wear and between taking uh, that end off to recondition it and renew it, quite a lot of material has disappeared. So that just tells you how good 1113s rockers still are. All right, so to recondition the ends of these rockers, I'm out here at my Sioux valve grinder. I have this rocker arm attachment fixed in place. It basically just holds the arm and keeps it up square against the face of that stone and allows you to squarely machine that and renew the surface. Pretty simple in the way that it works. There's a cone on the bottom, this cone on the top. So that centers the rocker. Tighten the wing nut. That will keep it uh, squared up with the stone. We have this tension spring right here, which will exert tension into the stone. And basically you just fire this thing up, creep the table over so that the rocker contacts the stone, and then you just rock the attachment. And that spring tension is what keeps that pad against the stone. And you can squarely refresh the end of that rocker arm. And quick disclaimer before we get going here, this machine it does have a pump with a tube that is supposed to uh, flow oil, lubricant, what have you, onto the stone. Keep things cool, keep things lubricated. The pump's been broken in this thing ever since I got it, and if I did more than one set of rockers every two years with this, I might get motivated enough to fix that pump. For now, <laughs> I'm not really going to worry about it. We have a look here. Could use just a little more. And that's nice. All right, time for the reassembly. All four rocker arms are reconditioned. I reinstalled the ball studs and the jam nuts in them just loosely for the time being. And started out by putting a light coating of assembly grease on the rocker shaft. So now we just reassemble in reverse order. Start with the washer, spring, the other washer. I'll just put light coating of the grease inside the rocker pivot area. Rocker goes on. Again, we'll just put a light coating in the stand. Stand goes on. We just make sure we have them oriented in the proper direction. The gap should face front along with the, uh, the foot that presses on the valve. Another light coating in here. I'll do that to every one of them. And we're just putting a little bit in here because this is an oil pressure feed system. So the oil will push any assembly loop back out. Lightly coat some of these washers on the thrust faces. Washer, long spring goes on. Washer. A 
rocker. Stand. Rocker. Now we're going to fight spring tension just a little bit. Stand it up here. Compress all those springs. Washer. End spring. Washer. And we'll just secure it for now with that cotter pen. Okay, so off camera, got that uh, cotter pen bent properly on that end, new one on the other end. So last thing we need to do is get that oil fitting in the middle. Sometimes you need to turn this center spring so that the hole is not obstructed. And I mentioned uh, during disassembly, the old one had quite a groove worn in it from those spring coils. That's uh, just kind of a side effect of these things. Luckily I found couple more really good ones in my uh, stockpile so we clean this one up we'll use that one we'll just start it in here for now sometimes it can be kind of fun to get the threads to engage between those coils there we are we'll just leave that one loose for now because I usually do the final tightening on these when I hook that oil feed line up to get the proper position of everything so that pretty much does it for this one so we've got half the job done, the other half is up next. I'll just carry out the same process to this other one, make this one look like that one, and then we'll continue on. See you guys back in a couple of hours. All right, both rocker assemblies have been reconditioned. This one was in the same condition as the other one. Everything is uh, still the same as far as clearances and specifications, so I'm considering those to be good to go. Now we move on to their plumbing, and I touched on this earlier in the video. The oil supply tube that was in 1113 originally, where it had broken right there. Um, you can tell by that break, by how dirty it is. It had been broken for quite some time. This copper can fret over time, become brittle and break, or this thing may have been mishandled at one point. Hard to say. So, I thought, no big deal. We'll just uh, go over to 2115 and see if... Uh, its supply line was still intact, being a, it's also an early unit and it has the same style. Thought I was good to go until I realized that this happens. So, no big deal. We could just resolder that joint, probably touch the others while we're at it. But, well, I had one last option beer can engine again. And despite that thing being in such horrid condition, this lovely artifact came out of it. And, I mean, it's all intact, it's all good. It's not even really misshapen, so we're going with the beer can engine oil line. Old 3J2219 is coming through for us once again. Um, one other thing to mention about these supply lines, the later tractors had a little different style, and this is a steel line. It's not the soldered brass and copper like those, and the joint is welded. Much more durable, and although it looks a lot different, it's a direct changeover. You just have to uh, change the angles of those uh, fittings that go into the rocker. Uh, shafts but this is always a fallback in case for some reason this one gives out but as you have likely seen with this series already I'm not so much about upgrading this thing as much as I am just trying to keep it correct as per the parts manual as much as possible I mean if I wanted to upgrade this I'd just buy a new cat tracked skid steer and just be done with it boom upgrade done but this is just beautiful. I like these old pieces like this. So this is what we're gonna go with. Now the easiest way to install this oil line is before these rockers get put onto the cylinder head because you're never gonna get enough flex in the line to get each end started inside of each L fitting once these are locked in location. So we'll just loosely start everything out here on the bench first. There we go. Now we can take it to the engine. And we'll just slide these down the studs. And it should also be noted that I pre-filled, there we are, get that started in. I pre-filled the upper cup portion of each push rod with a few drops of oil. 
I also have a light coating of oil on the valve stems and on the, uh, the rockers as well. When I'm doing things like setting valve lash, I prefer not to have a lot of grease all over everything. I just kind of like a, a thin film of oil much better. All right, I've got the hold down nuts for the rocker stands loose. And I've also ran the line fittings in just until they're ready to tighten up, but then I've backed them off. I want everything to be able to kind of float and equalize and decide where it wants to be because when you cinch these hold down nuts tight the rocker stands will collapse around the shafts and pretty much lock everything in that position. I should also note all of the ball studs are backed way off and all the rocker arms so that nothing is loaded here. So that should allow the shafts to pretty much position themselves where they are going to want to be. And again, no torque spec for these, just kind of a feel thing. But you don't want to over tighten these because I have seen these things split. Now that everything is where it wants to be, I'll tighten the fittings for the oil line. And now is the point where we can set the lash on the valves. You can see that's a bit excessive. The manual calls for 10 thousandths valve lash on both intakes and exhausts on a hot engine. Now, as an engine warms up, valve lash is going to decrease and we're setting this cold. So just for starters, I'm gonna go two thousandths more. We'll set these for 12. As the thing warms up, it's gonna get a little bit tighter. At 12, I know they're not gonna to get too tight. Um, that's just the kind of get it close strategy so that this thing can fire off and run. And we also have to remember, these rockers are all coming off again when it's time to do the second torque sequence on these cylinder head nuts anyway. So long as we get it close enough to run, we're gonna be pretty good. So I'll just hold the jam nut and we will crank the ball stud down, which decreases the valve lash clearance there we're touching. So we'll back it off. Now we'll, uh, we'll creep in on the 12 thousandths. Let's use a feeler gauge, 12 thousandths blade. I also should uh, say, I should have said this right up front, to set the valve lash, you want to make sure that the cam lobe for the valve that you are setting the clearance on is pointing down away from the lifter. If you're trying to set valve lash with a cam lobe pointing up or slightly up or just a little bit over, it could still be raising that lifter a little bit. And then when that does finally go down to the bottom, you'll end up with a lash that's way too loose. Should have said that right off the bat, but if you're setting a valve lash, that should pretty much be uh, self-explanatory. You shouldn't even have to really think about it. I've done it so many times. Okay, we tightened up on the blade. I'll go just a touch to the tight side because when I cinch the jam nut, it might change the position of the ball stud a little bit. Yep, and that is a good drag right there. Perfect. Just work my way on down the line. All right, so I've got the valve lash set on all the cylinders. Cylinder number two is currently a top dead center, and I'll show you one more check that I do whenever I'm putting one of these things together for the first time. We'll just actuate the compression release mechanism down here. And remember, it acts upon the intake valves, holding only the intake valves open. So we'll just uh, run those cam levers over, and you can see you can see the, uh, the compression release action moving those intake valves. So like I said, cylinder two is at top dead center, so the intake is being hung open. One thing I want to do is to test and see how far off the top of the piston the face of my valve is. As long as I can still get some movement like that before the valve hits the piston, I know I'm going to be good. Um, you know, with protrusion being reset, these valves are sticking out as proud as they're ever going to be. So when that compression release hangs them open even further and this thing's wheeling over, I just want to make extra sure that piston is going to stop and then turn back around and head back the other way before it smashes the, uh, the face of the valve. Check that on all four cylinders. All four checked out really good here. So I guess I'm happy with it. All right, final piece of the puzzle is this oil line that goes from the manifold up behind the decompression linkage into the cylinder head, feeds a small 90 degree passage that leads to the plumbing that carries oil on out to 
the rockers. So that was the last piece of the puzzle. We're done. Just spinning everything over now, making sure none of the rockers come close to the oil line and they all look good. Well, I'm glad to have the valve train knocked out of the way for 1113. Those rockers and stands and shafts are a lot of cleaning, some reconditioning, a lot of adjusting, but they're just as essential as everything else. That part's done, so now we can move on to something else. And as always, thanks for watching everybody.